Welcome to um, the Hope Cunningham Environmental Lecture. It's really wonderful to see so many new faces. And if this is your first time, welcome. I hope it won't be your last time. This is a series we put on every week. We have an amazing lineup of speakers that come Thursdays at noon, and we, you know, we would love to have, we would love to have you come again. Uh, if you want to learn more about the series, you can go to our website under news and events and see the Hope Cunningham Environmental Lecture Series. So it's a it's a really um, it's something that we try to do to sort of bring the community together, but also to sort of provide models to our students to think about what do careers in environmental studies look like. Um, and so some of you might be here and you might have, you know, internship opportunities for our students and we'd want you to share them. So before, uh, so this series is brought to you because of a really generous gift from two siblings who graduated from Tufts back in the 80s. Um, uh, the, the Hope Cunningham Environmental Lecture, Daphne Hope Cunningham and Roland Hope, who have endowed this series and allows us to bring you know, people like today's speaker to, to Tufts. So we're really um, thankful for their contributions. Uh, are you, at this point, I want to just make a couple announcements. So tonight is the Sustainability Networking Night in Breed Memorial Hall on Winthrop Street. If you are an undergrad thinking or a graduate student thinking about how you might get involved in the sustainability field, I would strongly encourage you to come. You can register on site. There is a, you, you don't have to do it. You, there's a handshake. You can go online, look it up in the Career Center. Um, and and sort of come tonight for this network working site and i will be there and i would look forward to seeing you uh similarly there's a whole bunch of different sort of industry nonprofits government sort of folks that are part of this networking site and there's going to be a list of those that are going to be available um for uh if you want to see that list that you can come and, and talk to sanette in the back who's going to wave her hand she's got the list so if you want to know who's coming, you can you can do that. So uh, the other announcement I want to make is that there's going to be a little, we're going to be passing the bowl. Uh, and we're not looking for your donations. She's, Sunette's holding in the back. We're looking for you to take a number out of said bowl. And at the end of today's talk, we're going to raffle three of Doug's books. So you could leave here with Nature Best Hope, a copy of Nature's Best Hope, which is one of my favorite books of all time. We read it in my book group and we thought this is just the kind of messaging we need. It's a fantastic book. And, and, and if we all sort of sort of follow the guidelines in this, it would be amazing. I won't take any more of, of Doug's story, but let me just introduce uh, Doug. Doug is an entomologist um, from the University of Delaware. He did his master's at Rutgers and then he went to, to Maryland for his PhD. And I was asking him how he got into this field because I remember his work as a grad student because he was doing some really intricate interactions between squash and squash beetles. And I'm thinking, how do you go from squash to trees? And he, and he was telling me that, that he, he bought some property not too far from the University of Delaware and, he, and, he, and, he, and it was overgrown with plants and a lot of those plants were non-natives. And he kept noticing as an, an entomologist, nothing's eating it, nothing's eating it, nothing's eating it. And said, well, what, where, where are all the insects? And so he discovered that they're not on the non-native plants. And so if there are no insects on the non-native plants, you might be happy if you're a home gardener, but you shouldn't be because all those insects eating the native plants are bird food. And so all of a sudden, you know, connecting it to sort of what is happening at higher trophic levels has really resonated with lots of people. And so he's gonna tell us about how to think about nature's best hope, how to think about making your garden good for biodiversity. And I'm not gonna say anything more because you have some amazing content. So join me in welcoming Dr. Doug Tallamy. Thank you, just test it. Can you hear? Can I hold it? Can he hold it or does he need to do yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. All right, good. Good. Um, all right, thanks, thanks, Colin. Apparently, time is short. So I have to dive right in. We're going to talk about uh, my idea of nature's best hope, but I'll give you this spoiler: your nature's best hope. So I'm really going to talk about why I think your nature's best hope. But before we do that, let's talk about what E.O. Wilson's idea 
of nature's best hope was. You all know E.O. Wilson, <clears throat> the late E.O. Wilson, unfortunately. But one thing that was consistent throughout his extremely long productive career was his love of life on planet Earth and his efforts to save them. I did turn it on. It is on, so <laughs> I'm gonna put it a little closer. Okay. How about that? Oh, that's better. He wanted to save life, save biodiversity, because he knew it was essential to our own survival. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life, and he had one simple message. If we're going to save life anywhere, anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. Or it's going to disappear everywhere, and that includes humans. Very bold statement. Uh, and he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that bold statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save nature on half of, of planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biologist, that's a great idea. We'll just put half the Earth aside and everything is disappearing. It could be in that half. We could be in the other half. It'll be great. But half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture. Uh, and I don't see that diminishing. Uh, and, and we've got 8 billion people with all of our hardscape and airports and detritus in the other half, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can we realize E.O. Wilson's dream? That's really what I want to talk about, because I think we can, but we need a new approach to conservation to do it. Before we talk about that, though, let's talk about what happened in the East Coast in 2019, and then again this year. We had a big oak mast. Members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. That's what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn to the little hole for its head. Then it forced its entire body through that hole. It was a tight squeeze. And once it's out of the acorn, it's a tight, it's a tight squeeze. Yeah, it's dangerous time for that insect larva because it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface. That takes about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions, forms a chamber, and within that chamber converts itself to a pupa. Uh, and it surprisingly stays in that underground chamber as a pupa for two years. After two years, comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do. That's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down there. They take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that acorn, or in that hole, and that's how the larva gets into the egg part. Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the next year the way most insects would? Well, it takes eight, uh, red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they come out the next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for it. Of course, after they leave the acorn, it leaves a hole. It's kind of like a true vacuum. You know, nature abhors a vacuum. In this case, she spelled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in holes made by acorn weevils after they have left the acorn. And if scouts find a new hole in a new acorn, they get all excited because the old acorn's falling apart. So they tell everybody, it's time to move the colony. Grab the larvae, grab the eggs, move the entire colony into the new acorn. That takes about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard there and make sure nobody else comes in. And that's where they'll live for the next two years until that acorn falls apart. <laughs> What's my point with this little story? Well, that's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They will take an acorn, fly up to a mile, maybe a mile and a half from the parent tree, tap it below the soil, the surface of the soil. And then the object is they're gonna go back in the winter time and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they planted three oak trees and a single jay can bury 4,500 acorns every fall. Specialized relationship between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That's what they rear their young on, carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants. You won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilii, unless you have facilia. That is the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is really common in our native bees. We've got between 3,600 and 4,000 species of native bees. Over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. You won't have the Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle head, or as we talked this morning, a little plantain in there. <clears throat> uh, I could go on and on talking about nature specialized relationships. But the point I want to make this morning is that 
many, most of these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave most of the lower 48 states as they were. There's only about 5% that's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And those are largely mountaintops. <clears throat> and that's because we've, we've logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. Got 770 million acres of rangeland out there, four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them. You could spell that any way you want. <clears throat> We've polluted our skies, changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature, the amount of ecosystem function that we humans need. So you might wonder why we've done this. I wonder why we've done this, and I don't know. But I suspect we thought that our nest, planet Earth, was so large we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequence. Of course, we were wrong about that, and that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days. Like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Uh, and now uh, the UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. And they said it two years ago. So now it's the next 18 years, I guess. Now that's a prediction, hasn't happened yet. And we have to make sure it doesn't happen. Because again, those are the species that run the ecosystems that support us. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, as, as Shakespeare would say, upon all of our houses. That's not what this talks about. This talks about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people, people like you and me. But those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Edwin Wade Teal decades ago said, we cannot make the world uninhabitable for other forms of life and have it habitable for ourselves. I mean, this is, this is just common sense. It's so common sense uh, that we don't seem to recognize it. <clears throat> Let's return briefly to this headline. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, back to E.O. Wilson. He told us exactly what would happen if insects disappeared from, from earth. And he did it way back in 1987 with this paper the little things that run the world. And again, his message was very simple. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants. And if most of the flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our vertebrate animals. Those food webs would collapse. The amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals would all disappear. In the biosphere, living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients, and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And again, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is good news, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, you people know all of this. Humans are products of nature, we're totally dependent on the life support that ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. Here are just a few things that plants do that we depend on every day, like produce oxygen, clean our water, carbon capture enormously important today, build topsoil, prevent floods, dampen severe weather, convert sunlight into food. If we lose our plants, we're gonna have to eat sunlight and then we will lose weight. What are our animals doing for plants? They're providing pest control services. They're pollinating nearly 90% of those flowering plants. They're dispersing plant seeds. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. It never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because of those 8 billion people that are demanding more and more ecosystem services every day. <clears throat> now we do have parks and we do have preserves. They're doing the best they can but it is obviously not good enough, which is why we are in the sixth great extinction event the planet has ever experienced. 
To me, the, the answer is obvious. We need to start practicing conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like that. Now, there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Elder Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. And one of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Have been indigenous groups, been able to do that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another place, doing the same thing, not sustainable behavior. But Adam Leopold had a lot of faith in humans. He believed we were capable of developing what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all those things. But he believed we could learn to do that gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called a land ethic, and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac, his most famous book. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we actually live. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot live together. We cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Ada Leopold's day, still embedded in our own culture. He might not have recognized it as an option. What I want to argue again today is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. <clears throat> in the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. And that means we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every year, but thrive. Where should we start? Well, back to private property. Most of the country's privately owned. Most of the, the, the uh, lower 48 states, 78% of the lower 48 states is privately owned, 85.6% east of the Mississippi. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. And we can't afford to fail. I'm gonna use the word conservation. I'm not using it exactly the way I mean. We do wanna to continue to conserve any bits of nature that are left out there. That's been our conservation model for the last century, and we want to keep doing that. But it's obviously not good enough. So now we have to move beyond conservation into restoration. We have to rebuild natural systems in as many of those places where we've dismantled them as possible. And before you tell me, well, there's no way you're going to put it back together again exactly the way it was, uh, you're probably right. We've changed too many things. But we can reunite enough of those specialized interactions I opened the talk with to create functional ecosystems again, even if it's not exactly what was on a particular piece of land at some point in the past. But to do that, we have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with the most powerful groups. And there's two groups we can't do without. One is the flowering plants. And of course, the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. They are capturing energy from the sun and through photosynthesis, turning it into simple sugars and carbohydrates which is the food that supports just about all the animals on the planet. <laughs> so now we have the food that animals need locked up in plant tissues, mostly leaves. It turns out that most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat invertebrates that ate those plants. Most of those invertebrates are insects and not just any insect. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't support a lot of caterpillars, uh, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. Now I'm going to use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, that is the chickadee at, at the, my house in southeast Pennsylvania. You've got the black-capped chickadee up here. Uh, practically the same bird doing the same thing. Those are the birds that are feeders all winter long eating seeds, and we tend to think that's all chickadees need. But even in the wintertime, only 50% of their diet is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders, even in the wintertime. And when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds at all. That is the typical state of birds. The babies can't eat seeds. So they switch to invertebrates. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they're not exception. 96% of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. And most of those insects are caterpillars. <clears throat> so what is special about caterpillars? Actually, several things special about caterpillars. One of them is that they're soft. Think of this guy as, as a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. 
the thin wrapper is it's exoskeleton. It's, it's made of chitin, it's undigestible. And because they're soft, you can stuff them down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough, beaks like the plunger. They're also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in, in protein, low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. And a lot of beetles have really sharp edges too. And finally, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. I mentioned carotenoids, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate. You're a vertebrate. Birds are vertebrates. We vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting their carotenoids from? Again, during the breeding season, before the berries and the other things are out. <clears throat> well, from all those prey items they bring back to the nest, but look, Carotenoid content is not equally distributed among bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. Here are the adult caterpillars. Here are the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating the green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way over here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So that study and several others are suggesting that caterpillars are not optional parts of most bird diets. They are essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? It's a good question. So back to Carolina chickadees. Um, a lot of data on Carolina chickadees. A guy named Richard Brewer way back in 1962 sat at the nest of chickadees and counted how many caterpillars come in. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they uh, uh, fledge, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days, but they're flying all around and nobody's been able to count those. So, you know, we estimate it's tens of thousands of caterpillars required to get one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce to the point of independence. And guess what happens when they're independent? They keep eating caterpillars. If you want chickadees to breed in your yard, you've got to have all those caterpillars because they're only foraging about 50 meters from the nest. Again, true for most birds, they forage very close to the nest. They are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not include all those caterpillars in our yards, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the factors causing the bird declines that we're measuring. Uh, we went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al., the Smithsonian group that said we've lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups, the species that require insects, typically when they're breeding, and the species that do not require insects. So things like finches and doves and crossbills can actually make a little milk out of the seeds they eat. They don't need insects. And look, they didn't, they didn't decline at all in the last 50 years. But the species that require insects declined on average 10 million individuals per species. That doesn't prove cause and effect, but it does suggest as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. So we need to raise the, lands, the, the bar about what we're asking our landscapes to do. In the past, We've asked them to do one thing, be pretty. Now we're gonna ask them to do two things, be pretty and ecologically functional at the same time. And they're not gonna be ecologically functional unless we put those caterpillars and other insects back into our, our yards. So how do you add caterpillars to a landscape? Well, you put the plants that support those caterpillars in that landscape. It seems pretty straightforward. But there is a catch, and that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to be fussy about which plants we choose for our landscapes because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And, and the monarch butterfly illustrates it perfectly. You can have all the calorie pear and all the ginkgos and all the hostas and all the burning bush and all the buckthorn and all the, the barberry, all the things we typically landscape with in our yards and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. 
The only thing that's going to make a monarch butterfly is one of the milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. Why is that? Well, plants have made them specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. That's actually just one type of defense, but makes those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, which is why it's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well defended. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat plants for which they have very specialized adaptations that allow them to circumvent, get around those chemical defenses. Specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to those compounds. It takes a long period of, of evolutionary interactions with particular plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant lineage. So if you take the milkweeds out of your yard and replace them with hostas, don't expect the monarch to start to make a living on your hostas. It's locked into eating milkweeds, and it's got two choices then. Fly away and find milkweeds someplace else, or starve to death. Three kinds of plants out there. It's very simple. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and plants that remove energy from local food webs. The very best contributor across the country, in 84% of the counties in which it occurs, is one of our oaks. They're contributing more energy to local food webs by far than any other plant genus. Ginkgo biloba from Asia, good example of a non-contributor. It's a nice ornamental tree, has good fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo. So it's not adding any energy to the local food web. And a good example of a detractor would be calorie pear, Bradford pear, burning bush, barberry, doesn't matter what. They're adding very little energy to the local food web, but they're not staying where we plant them. They escape and become major invasive species in our natural areas, pushing out the native plants that do contribute energy. So the net result is they're removing energy from local food webs. All I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. We are not going to be able to restore ecosystems if we don't have functional food webs in those ecosystems. And you're not gonna have functional food webs if you don't choose the right plants. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well this works when we do choose the right plants. Starting with my house right here, I should say our house, my wife lives there too. In Oxford, Pennsylvania, Southeast Pennsylvania, that's what it looked like uh, shortly before we moved in. But uh, as, as Colin said, it had been, it was mowed for hay uh, before we moved in. Um, but it was taken out of mowing three years before we moved in. So what really came back was a tangle of, of uh, invasive species. The first thing we had to do was remove those. But I wanted to see, and we wanted, wanted to rebuild the ecosystem here We'd never done that before, uh, but I wanted to see whether if I put a host plant of a particular caterpillar in my yard, would that caterpillar come and make a living there? And the first thing I tried was the Canadian owlet. I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pretty little thing. That's what the adult looks like, just like uh, a leaf. Well, Canadian owlets depend on metaru. That's their host plant. We didn't have any metaru. We didn't have much of anything. Uh, now, I'm sure there was meadow root that grew there before, but the farm had been farmed for over 300 years. Meadow root, long gone. So I got some meadow root seeds from someplace, and I planted them, and they grew very nicely. But this was early on, and I actually had very little faith that Canadian owlets would appear out of somewhere and find my little patch of, of meadow root. So I didn't even go out and check it for two months after I planted. And then I was walking by for another reason. I looked over. It was covered with Canadian owlets. They had found it right away. I'm still impressed with that. So now we have a good population of Canadian owlets and metaru. We've added two species to the property. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer. A beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa, ditch daisy. We didn't have any Biden's aristosa, but I did know where there was a, a population in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. 
As a matter of fact, last year they took over our front yard. That's all right. It took a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my patch of Bidens, but they did. And now we got a good population of both of those. We've added four species. I want to see if I get the hackberry emperor to make a living in our house, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs there. It's one of the species that ought to be there. Well, as its name suggests, it's a specialist on hackberry, on celtus. We didn't have any hackberry. So I planted a couple of hackberry trees. I had to wait four years for the hackberry emperor to find my hackberry, but they did. And now we've got a good population of those added six species. That is how the restoration proceeded. I did not plant goldenrod, it came in on its own. And along with it came many of the things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the Arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginosis, the goldenrod gall moth. There are 110 species of moths that use goldenrod in the mid-Atlantic states. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I hear some people don't like it. But I don't know why. It's a great native plant. It's got good fall color. It's a good ground cover. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It makes valuable berries for the birds in the fall. And by valuable, I mean they're high in fat. Our migrating birds need sources of fat. Our overwintering birds need sources of fat. And those berries come from tiny little inconspicuous flowers. You don't even know when Virginia creepers in bloom until you see this big cloud of native bees around it. It's a wonderful pollinator plant. Remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, that's okay. I plant a Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths that are an important component of cardinal diets. Things like Pandora Sphinx and its beautiful adult, the Leonard Sphinx, the Hog Sphinx, the Abbott Sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I uh, want to see if I get the evening primrose moth to make a living at our house <clears throat> because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Well, as you might suspect, it requires evening primrose and we didn't have any, so I planted it. The moth did come, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but it's always very cute. And I planted lots of oak trees. Now, these are just examples of the plants we have put back on our yard. But I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. That is the Bedford oak uh, in Bedford, New York, Martha Stewart land. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right. <laughs> but if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local food web, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to call in the moths that make the caterpillars that run the food web at our house. Things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, Suzuki's promolactus, the red wash caterpillar, the orange vested moth, or yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the medium dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange packed smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampi, the oblique heterocampi, the red line panopoda, the laffer. And literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property and look, they come right away. This is a pin oaks just popped its head above the leaves and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oak to start to support your local food web. They will do it the very first year. That's what our property looks like now taken from pretty much the same place I took that first picture. Just to give you an idea, we put some of the plants back. I'm still working on it, <clears throat> but over the last, couple decades. My research has shown that if you know the number of species of moths in your local food web, moths, not butterflies. Butterflies are bad tasting day flying moths. And because they don't taste very good, they're not contributing that much energy to local food webs. So if you have the number of species of moths, you have a very good index of the stability of that food web and the productivity of that food web, the number of species it's contributing, it's supporting. So six years ago, I started to take a picture of every species of moth uh, on, on our property. I am still at it, uh, but I'm up to 1,259 species uh, that are there now. And I've got a PowerPoint to show you if you want to see it. Um, because we put the plants back, because we put the plants back. Now we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 29.4 million acres. 
So on one twenty, one two point nine millionth of the land mass, we have forty eight percent of all the moths that occur in the entire state. Nature's really resilient. It will it will restore itself if you give it half a chance. And because so many of those moths are types of bird food, we have recorded sixty two species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, not, not flew by, bread. Why? Because we've got the bird food. It's that simple. Why am I telling you this? So this is another headline that we see all the time. The World Wildlife Fund says, Earth has lost two thirds of its wildlife since uh, 1970. It's a terrible statistic. But I'm thinking, not at our house. I am convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds. It didn't take that long and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. What would happen if everybody put the plants back? We really could turn headlines like that around. But a good question is, will it work on smaller properties in suburbia? It's a very good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. Uh, they're in the middle of a development. They're surrounded by everybody with the big lawns. When they moved into their property, it was choked with Armor honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, another important invasive species. So they got rid of that. They planted 70 species of native plants, put in a water feature they call a bubbler, and then they started to count the birds that are using their yard, and they are up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species, an incredible number. Just to compare it with our house, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Absolutely. How about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean, in Chicago, her property abuts O'Hare Airport. She has one tenth of an acre, three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. She's not connected to any natural area at all. Uh, so she's a tiny island in Chicago. She's a pretty island because Pam is a native plant landscaper and she knows how to do it. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature, and then she started to count the birds using her yard. She says she sat back with a glass of wine. And she's up to 125 species that have used her one-tenth of an acre in the middle of Chicago, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. All right, there's four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way, and we need to succeed in a big way. And one of those things are those big lawns. We've got the last figure I saw was 44 million acres of lawn in this country. That is an area bigger than all of New England dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Why do we do that? Well, lawn's a status symbol and we need to display our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut that area in half? We're not gonna get rid of lawn, but let's cut the area in half. Let's take spaces like this and turn them into this. I got this picture from Dan Getman. I've never met Dan Getman, but he had this big lawn and he's putting these plants in and he wanted to show me. Well, let's make the math simple. Let's say we've got 40 million acres. We're going to cut it in half. That'll give us 20 million acres that we can restore right at home. And it will be enough to create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badland National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge. Plus the Great Smoky Mountains, they add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park would be the biggest park in the country. Uh, it, Homegrown National Park is a real thing. You can you'll go to our website, uh, homegrownnationalpark.org. It's a small nonprofit. Register your property on the map. And so the, this, the location where it is and the amount of area you're going to be a good steward of. Maybe you really are going to reduce your lawn. Maybe you're going to plant an oak. Maybe you're going to put an ester in a flower pot. Whatever you do counts, and then your little piece of your county is going to light up with a firefly. And the object is to get the message that everybody's responsible for the future of conservation to go viral. We want the whole country to light up. And by the way, it's free. Our mission, we, just, we want to regenerate biodiversity by motivating millions of people not just a few, but millions of people to plant natives, remove invasive plants from their property, and reshape their relationship with nature. So we're gonna reduce the lawn. What plants should we put in the area that was once lawn? <clears throat> I'm gonna argue that some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants uh, because they are such important components of food webs. 
So remember what a keystone is. It is the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take it out of the arch, the arch falls down. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they're the plants making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that hold that house up. They are the support system, they're essential. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do with our, our uh, non-native ornamentals for the last century. Best keystone plant in the country, I've already said, is one of the oaks in the mid-Atlantic states. They support 557 species of, of caterpillars. Just to compare that to something like a tulip tree, it's another good native tree, it only supports 21. So the huge differences among our native plants. Over 950 species nationwide, there is no other plant genus that comes close to that. <clears throat> How do you know what the best plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the rank list of the most important woody and herbaceous genera in your county will pop up because this changes as you move around the country. So the old excuse of, I don't know what to plant, that's just an excuse now. Now you do know what to plant. Go to Native Plant Finder. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to use keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which is not the goal. It turns out that light pollution is another one of the major causes of insect declines around the country. And these are all the ways that lights are killing our nocturnal insects, particularly the moths that run our, our food webs. But to me, this is good news. This is good news because we've got to stop. We've got to reverse insect decline. We have already lost more than 45% of our insects on the planet. They are the little things that run the world. If we can turn that around by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. There are a lot of switches to flick, but there's a lot of us. We can flick those switches. But right away, I'm going to hear, oh, I can't turn the light out over my barn or my garage or my front porch because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on your security light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you'll notice is the bedman does not come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. You can get these at the hardware store. Yellow wavelengths do not attract nocturnal insects, particularly the moths. Uh, if we switched out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, we'd save millions of dollars too. So we're gonna shrink the lawn, we're gonna use keystone plants, we're gonna modify our light system, then we're gonna invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all of our insects. Booming business around the country. Uh, and they say it's okay, because what they are fogging is a natural organic product. It sounds, it sounds great. And it is a natural organic product. It is pyrethroids made by chrysanthemums to kill insects. But cyanide is a natural organic product. Ricin is a natural organic product. Nicotine is a natural organic product. Being natural organic does not make it non-toxic. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. And they're not even close to true or being accurate with that. Um, this is the result of a mosquito fogging event on Kent Island in uh, the Chesapeake. My friend happened to be there and he picked up a handful of dead monarchs, but there were thousands of them on the ground. It was in the middle of a big migration and they fogged anyway. The mosquito fogging kills everything. Everything it comes in contact with, it kills the monarchs, kills the pollinators we're trying to make. And the interesting thing is it does not control mosquitoes, which means we're doing it for nothing, except they charge you to do it for nothing. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. It's too hard. You have to kill 90% of them to get good control. These guys kill between 10 and 50%. If you really want to control mosquitoes, do it in the larval stage. And this is what the homeowner can do. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay, put it out in the sun so it can build up populations of diatoms and algae for a couple of days. That becomes an irresistible brood of female mosquitoes who are gonna lay their eggs because that's what larval mosquitoes eat, diatoms and, and algae. So they will preferentially lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunce, $12 for a season's worth of control. That's Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. It's targeted, it's cheap, and if everybody did it, it would work. Fourth thing we need to do uh, is to think about how we landscape under our trees so that we can allow the caterpillars that are running our, our food webs to complete their development. 
Now this is this is a new idea, but um, and this is just an example. I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them, like the Polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, then it does it all over again. Everything happens on the tree. And I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 94% of them will finish growing as caterpillars on the tree and then they drop from the tree and they wiggle their way underneath the soil and they pupate underground or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. <laughs> We don't tolerate it, it's messy. And we mow and compact the areas under our tree so that they're rock hard, particularly in the summertime. Uh, and the caterpillars drop down and probably die. I've got a grad student working on this now, but this is an oak tree here. But this becomes an ecological trap. The moths come in, they love the oaks, they lay their eggs, the caterpillars drop down and die. And I think that I'm convinced this is another major cause of insect declines around the country, the way we landscape under our trees. And of course, the cement landscape is not the answer either. So this is what most people do. You've got a tree in your yard. And as I said, I've got a grad student measuring well, how well caterpillars do in a situation like that. But I guarantee they're going to do better in a situation like this where you have a layered landscape. You've got, you've got soft landing. The caterpillars fall down. The ground is not compacted. Nobody's going to mow them. Nobody's going to step on them. There's a lot of leaf litter down there. Uh, much higher survivorship. This is, this is where you can do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn. You put big beds around every tree and all of a sudden you have less lawn. Your tree will love it and so will those caterpillars. Use the uh, native ground covers we have liberally, things like wild ginger. There's uh, Virginia creeper as a, as a ground cover, may apple, foam flower, ferns. If you can see the ground under your tree, you don't have enough plants. Green mulch is the way to go. Again, the tree will love it and so will those caterpillars. Former grad student Desiree Narango did some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and her results suggest there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices. And compromise, believe it or not, is a good thing. She had one simple question. How well do chickadee populations do in, in suburban, the D, suburban D.C. area on native, in suburban yards where, that, are, that are dominated by native plants versus suburban yards dominated by typical introduced ornamentals? And when they're dominated by introduced ornamentals, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Now, everybody had a nest box up in, in their yard. But the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try to breed. If they did try to breed, they laid 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And if you put all that into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass from zero to 100% in your yard, this is what you get. We looked at woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage on woody plants. The dotted line here is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live that long. And if you reproduce at that rate, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, anything above the line here, which is what you have when there's very few non-native plants, then you have a growing population. But if you are below the line here, when you have a lot of non-native plants, then you're making fewer babies than adults die and you have a shrinking unsustainable population. Now right here is where those lines uh, intersect very liberally speaking. So it suggests you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native without destroying the local food web. We can't tolerate any invasives, no barberry, no, no burning bush, because they're ecological tumors. They just escape and, and keep growing. But there are a lot of uh, ornamental plants that are not invasive. Remember Dan Getman, that's a ginkgo tree. Did you pick that up the first time? Why does Dan have a ginkgo tree in his native planting? Well, Dan's wife likes ginkgo trees and Dan likes his wife. The question is, is this tree wrecking the ecological uh, productivity of this landscape? No, it's just there. Is it gonna escape and become a serious invasive species? No, 
It's just there. It's not contributing. It's just standing there. So I like to think of plants like that as if they're statues. So there you go. There's Dan's statue. Now, if everything on Dan's property was a statue, it would not be a functional landscape. But it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys local food webs. It's the absence of those highly productive natives. If we increase the percentage of these, we can tolerate a lot of these. Can we use, oh, we're getting rid of that. Um, can municipalities help us live with, with nature? Yes, they can, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost sharing program that is paying homeowners, encouraging them to reduce or replace their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. It's very popular. Pennsylvania has a similar program now. There's an island off of Florida, I think it's Marco Island, that is paying residents to allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard. Burrowing owls, listed species. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it, rather than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Put a bounty on these invasive ornamentals like calorie repair. That's what St. Louis, Missouri did, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, now North Carolina has a bounty on them. If you take out a calorie repair, you get a free tree replacement. Water utilities are giving people $100 coupons to use water efficient native plants. And of course the big lawn reduction programs in, in the far West, particularly California, that's gone up now. For every square foot of lawn you get rid of in California, you get $3 rebate if you replace it with a xeric plant. Okay, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one is, is serious. We're starting to think of nature as if it's optional. It is not essential. We like nature. We like to go bird watching or just go out and commune with nature, ride our bikes, but it's not essential. Congress has labeled the, the uh, budget for the national park system as non-essential. Uh, well, of course, if it's not essential, when push comes to shove, when resources are in short supply, which is always, nature will take a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out, and there's this, this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of, of uh, conservation. We want to save wildlife. We want to save nature so that future generations can enjoy it. It was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for expanding the national park system. These are beautiful places. We want to save them so the future generations can enjoy it. And I get that because nature is enormously entertaining. But it's much more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. A little bit more urgent. We also uh, assume that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about that. <laughs> but if we restrict conservation efforts just to the places where there's not a lot of humans, we're going to fail because those places now are too small, too few, and too isolated. David Quammen has a wonderful analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That's not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I don't like that language because it suggests there's places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadways, even including much of our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. We've got to put the plants back, not just to make biological carters that connect viable habitat with each other, but to recreate viable habitat in all those places where we've destroyed. The good news is this is starting to happen. It really is starting to happen. And when it does, it'll be the first time in modern human history that we have coexisted with the natural world. Our third misstep is to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, a few ecologists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every single person on the planet. But I don't know why, since every single person on the planet depends entirely on the quality of local ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody share the responsibility of taking care of those ecosystems. Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you're taught them. We've been very good at teaching these, teaching everybody we've got rights, but we've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living. 
but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. Now, every day, more and more people recognize the earth has got some serious issues, but they all feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can fire Mosquito Joe. One person can put a motion sensor on their, their lights. One person can use keystone plants. One person can plant a pollinator garden. One person can get rid of the invasive species on their, their landscape. We didn't even talk about that. There's a whole bunch of things that one person can do to totally revitalize their local landscape. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable. Don't worry about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. So I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. We have time for questions. So I will bring the mic to you if you have a question and then we will do the raffle after a few questions. And then if there's time for more, we'll do that. So I'm keen to keep an eye on time. Um, I just had a question about oaks. Are there bad oaks? <laughs> yes. Which ones are they? The ones from China, the ones from Europe. We've got Quercus Sagittarius. It's, it's actually an invasive species. They plant it all over the place. Uh, Land managers plant it for a long time because it makes lots of acorns. It actually turns out those acorns are so bitter, most of our wildlife won't touch them, but it keeps spreading and spreading. We've got 91 species of oaks in this country. There is no reason why we have to use oaks from another country. So I grew up at a time where I remember this, but I don't know if there's a quick answer and I guess it came back, but in New England, there's a, you went through the list of caterpillars and moss very quickly. Did you mention the gypsy moth caterpillar and what's the significance to the ecological system? I did not. First of all, all the ones I mentioned are in my yard. Um, we have an occasional gypsy moth. It's now the spongy moth, but uh, that's an invasive species. That is a species from another, from Europe we brought over. It is here without its natural enemies. Uh, so just like invasive plants, it's not under natural control. So it goes crazy and it causes lots of problems. Uh, it will defoliate oaks. And if it does it in, in two or three years in a row and the oaks on poor soil, it can kill it. Uh, so what do you do? You gotta control the gypsy moth, you gotta control the spongy moth, but if you spray it, you're killing everything else on that oak, which clobbers the migrating birds that need those, those caterpillars. So like just about all the invasive species, plants and animals that we have over here, it causes huge problems. We are not promoting non-native insects of any kind. Wow, awesome, thanks very much. Can you talk about ticks in the food web? Here in Massachusetts, we have a war on ticks. A lot of people use pesticides. They plant grasses to keep it short, to keep the ticks out. We're not too far from Lyme, Connecticut, right? So. Yeah, I've had Lyme disease five times, I get it. Um, we have too many ticks because we have too many deer. When we grew up, there were no, no, I mean, they were there, deer ticks. We didn't even know what they were. There was no Lyme disease. The only time I saw a deer when I was growing up, I didn't see it. It was a footprint in my front yard and it was so rare. We made a plaster cast of it and it was on my, my desk. But then the deer exploded. Of course, we took away their predators. We planted perfect edge habitat everywhere. Uh, and now we have deer up to 14 times over the carrying capacity. So of course the, the lime ticks, the short black-legged tick, deer tick that depends on deer as part of its life cycle has exploded. Um, how do you really control ticks? You get the, the deer population back down. And I know that's a social issue, but that's really what we have to do. Can you landscape in a way that, that discourages ticks? Ticks like high humidity. So you're right, if you have swaths of grass, they, they won't go there. They wanna be in the vegetation. They don't chase you. They go up in the edge of a, a 
plant and they they quest. They put their little legs out. When you walk by, they grab grab on you. Um, there's a product that's called Daminex, I think. It's it's uh, it's a cardboard tube with cotton in it uh, that's laced with pyrethroids. And the white-footed mouse, which is the other part of the the uh, Lyme disease cycle, will take that back to its nest, and the pyrethroids kill the tick on it. Uh, and I have heard it works somewhat. Spraying the world is just not the answer. Um, you kill everything else. So, so use Daminex, um, stick to the lawn. The most effective type time is uh, May and June. You can get a, a deer tick anytime, but the time where infectivity rates are the highest is May and June. And if you have a landscape that has lots of other mammals in it, possums, coons, raccoons, chipmunks, um, they're dead end hosts for the Lyme disease tick. You know, an interesting statistic is that uh, there are a lot of ticks in the South, there's a, a lot of deer in the South, and there's almost no Lyme disease. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of, of lizards on the ground. There's, there's a blue-tailed skink, there's a lot of anoles, and they're all dead end hosts. So the ticks get on those guys and, and it uh, keeps the disease at a very low level. So the higher diversity we have in our landscapes, the lower the chance of you getting ticks. The real answer though is control those deer. Okay, so we're gonna quickly, uh, there is another question. We'll see if we get to it afterwards, but if you have number eight, uh, you are a winner of the book. If you are number 15, you are a winner of the book, or if you are 66. So if you have eight, 15 or 66, stand up and Sunette will come find you. We have one standing way up. <laughs> <laughs> eight 15 66 congratulations and enjoy the book so nick has one last question here and this will be it that was a really cool talk um so if everyone adopts this really cool idea then that would put a big um not burden, but demand on nurseries, right? Or whoever's selling the plants. Opportunity, opportunity. Opportunity, yeah. yeah. But um, nurseries are also like one of the biggest um, reservoirs for fungal plant pathogens. Um, so how do you like think uh, chestnut blight, American chestnut went extinct from an invasive fungal pathogen? And that's much harder to regulate than say invasive plant species. Um, how how do you envision that like downstream? Uh... If we had had a rule that said you may, may not bring in non-native chestnuts, we wouldn't have the chestnut blight. So it's not that they're just harboring and then bringing them in from other other continents. Chestnut blight, the anthrac and, and the dogwood anthracnose, um, sudden oak death syndrome, all these things are being brought in from other places. That's the problem. So I envision what, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so we need native nurseries that are not near exotic plants to bring in the diseases. Okay, we're gonna have to stop there. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Doug. Big round of applause.